Welcome to Front Porch Gospel this morning. Turn around and say hi to three or four or five or six or seven people this morning if you would not mind. Good morning, y'all. Glad to have you at home Howdy. watching right now. We're glad to have you here having a wonderful time. Hey, Casey, if you can put that other slide up there. Hey, we've got a really fun event. You've been seeing stuff about it. Now we're going to tell you what it is. Uh, a week from this Saturday, June 18th, we're going to have a church 60th anniversary party. Can you believe this church is 60 years old? It doesn't even have a gray hair. i tell you what. <laughs> But anyway, we're going to have a great time on that Saturday night. It'll be downstairs from 5 to 8 p.m. Everybody, you're welcome to come. It's going to be a, a lot of fun. We want you to, if you don't have to, but if you'd like to dress in your 50s or 60s type of attire, we're going to do that. We're going to have food and fun, music and dancing. You don't have to dance, but uh, some of us are going to, I guess, and that ought to be interesting. But anyway, we're going to have a good, good time celebrating this church's 60th anniversary a week from Saturday. How many think that's going to be a fun time? All right, so don't but Yippee! You're singing, man. Let's have a word of prayer and start. Father, we love you. We praise you. You are so good. Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would have his way in this place today in your precious name. Amen.
station where the mighty hosts of heaven sing. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. Turn your radio on. If you want to hear the songs of Zion coming from the land of endless spring, get in touch with God. comes 
it's easy when life's at its best. Now it's down in the valley of trials and temptations. That's where your faith is really put to the test. For the God of singing that with me. I'm just letting her know. She can't keep escaping every time we do it. Um, this next song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. When, when I was a little girl, my grandma used to sit me at the piano and try to teach me how to play piano, and we used to learn on this song. And um, when she was older and couldn't remember much about who I was or who she was or anything else, I could place her hand on the piano, on the, the start keys, and she could play and sing this whole entire song without a glitch. And uh, Wes had said he knew folks like that that had been able to do that. So we're gonna do this one and uh, think of Grandma.
Sure appreciate everybody coming out for Front Porch Gospel today. Hope you're having a good time. See, Greg's having a good time. Wes having a good time. <laughs> Nick's having a good time. Yeah, we're having a good time, I guess. Honestly, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, a lot of us <clears throat> enjoy the old-time gospel music. Hardly any place around you can find that these days. But you can find it here. Yeah. And we, we're trying to do it like it was in the old days as much as we can. And... Uh, just keep it authentic that way. And so you participating here makes it really great for all of us. It, it lets us know there's a place where some people would like to hear the old music. And uh, we'll just keep adding the so old songs. If you have a song you want to be included that's an old time bluegrass or country gospel, or even maybe a little bit of southern gospel feel to it, uh, we'll try to add that in. And if you want to sing a song like that, you let us know. We'll work it up for you the way you want it, and you can come up and sing it. How you like that? So, honestly, that's, that's what we'll do. So, t today's message is just simply uh, a uh, message from the book of Hebrews. But I think I'm jumping the gun on that because there should be a video opener for this. I'm going to let y'all see that. Yeah. Oh. White guy with a beard? Yeah. Oh my God, you are! You're Jesus Christ! He died for our sins so that we could be saved. A white guy, looks like he's from the 60s. A reason to believe and to continue on in your life and your journey. Not that blonde haired dude that they show in all those pictures. I think Jesus was just a story made up by someone. Could have been probably a, a, a real person. It's something special, but uh, not, not, not like the story says. Yeah. I'm actually glad you're all here tonight. I want to tell you that one of you will betray me. Ah, <laughs> just kidding. Ah, he's doing that thing he did in this story book. Uh, Jesus, a friend of mine from Puerto Rico. I don't know. I, I don't know Jesus very well, so... Jesus? Like Jesus, the Son of God? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Definitely not the guy who cuts my lawn. Dear Tiny and for Jesus. Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. Yes, there's definitely something special about Jesus. The same things that are special about me and you and, well, everybody. Definitely good morals and beliefs, and, um possibly had some special gift. Oh, oh my it's God! Jesus. Oh my God. It's, it's him! It's Jesus! And his best pal, Peter! Oh, 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 wow! Who do you say Jesus is? <laughs> he's really important because his birthday's coming up. People believe in Jesus. He's your savior. He's number one. Everyone is giddy with anticipation for Jesus to come out because, as we all know, if Jesus comes out of his house and is not scared by his shadow, it means the next thousand years will be full of peace and love. He was just really chill. I think he even smoked some pot, so I love Jesus even more. He seems like a kind of Gandhi-type guy. Some superpower. I just don't know. I, I believe him. My name, so... <laughs> uh, he was Jewish. Look, I think he's inspiring for a lot of people, so that's really cool to me. God bless him. <laughs> a make-believe story that's got blown out of proportion. So what's your answer? You're out on the street and somebody walks up to you with a microphone and a camera and says, Who's Jesus? That's, that's a good, good question, question, isn't it? How did you like all of their answers? Or Peter Griffin standing in as Peter the disciple. You got that, right? That's one of the biggest questions in life, though, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Remember what Jesus actually said to Peter, and who do you say that I am? Remember, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. In other words, the Messiah. And all of us, at some point, need to answer for ourselves, who is this Jesus? Consider this. Every person here walked into the room today with some concerns, <clears throat> Uh, some preoccupations, fears, maybe worries, 
and maybe some things that you're even happy about. But I guarantee you, every one of us walked in here with some concerns and some things uh, that would be, if we could just state it that way, would be a matter for prayer that we would just love to have answered right now today. True? Just tells us all of us are facing situations and circumstances bigger than ourselves, bigger than our ability to uh, change it to the way we would like it to be. And every one of us has some, some level of struggle with sin. It means we all need Jesus. And when we have Jesus, we realize, although we may get distracted and may get caught up in fears and worries and concerns, but when we truly have Jesus in our lives, we ultimately come to the place where we realize he's all that we need. He fulfills everything. I'm going to do just a few messages out of Hebrews here, but here's something really interesting. You know, the book of Hebrews is called the riddle of the New Testament. And uh, truth is, nobody knows a whole lot about it. The theology in it is fantastic. In other words, it uh, shows us that the writer of the book of Hebrews had a deep knowledge of ancient Hebrew theology and Hebrew history, but also a uh, sound use of the Greek language and uh, the uh, Greek philosophies of the day and was able to reason and um, teach even from the perspective of Greek philosophy, the Greek language, and ancient Hebrew theology, and even using the terminology of the ancient Hebrews. There was questions even as whether Hebrews would be included in the Bible early on, but obviously it is. But from a theological perspective, it is one of the deepest books that we could ever dig into. And yet it deals with some very basic things, such as, who is Jesus? Hebrews chapter 1. I like this. If we ask the question, who is Jesus? In John chapter 14, we read, uh, one of the disciples said, Lord, show us the Father. That's all we need. And Jesus said, Philip, I've been with you for a long time. Don't you know who I am? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, this gets really interesting because oftentimes when we say God, we are specifically re referring to God the Father, aren't we? That's what we think of, God the Father. But the fact is that God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit co-equal. Did you know that? Three in one. I've often heard people say to me, well, no, 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 you've got that wrong. Jesus isn't God. Jesus is the Son of God. And yet Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I also like where it mentions in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And then, of course, we go to the Gospel of John, which... John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Once again, we have this teaching that is just unmistakably brought out in Scripture, that Jesus is eternal God. That's hard for some people to grasp. But as a matter of fact, I've heard people say, no, 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 don't confuse Jesus with God. He was a prophet. Was Jesus a prophet? Well, yeah, his three major roles in his earthly life when he lived as a man were prophet, priest, and king. He, all three of those. And if you think about this, the role that Jesus is functioning in right now as God the Son is the role of priest. He is making intercession for us. What does a priest do? Talks to God for humans and talks to humans for God. And we're told in the scripture that Jesus Christ makes intercession for us. He is uh, our mediator. Uh, the scripture says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So in his humanity side, he is our only mediator between us and God. We don't need anyone else as a go-between to get to God. It is Jesus Christ because, indeed, he is God. 
And uh, it's hard to get our minds around the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, isn't it? That Jesus is truly God. But we get that repeated throughout scriptures. In the book of Hebrews, the gospel of John, and uh, we see that uh, in uh, Matthew and Luke as well. And so we just continually get this teaching that Jesus Christ is indeed 100% God. You say, well, well, I thought he was God and man. This is the hard part to get. When Jesus was in a human body, was he God or was he man? Or was he part God and part man? Now it gets a little more complicated. Let me confuse you a little bit more with that, okay? Just because I like doing that. Uh, can you believe or can you process the idea that during his human lifetime, Jesus was 100% God and 100% human? How could that be? The two in one being. He's fully man and fully God at the same time. It's amazing. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand Jesus as being God if we look at what Jesus has done. I want to start off with the first thing that Jesus has done is uh, created the universe. Now that's a pretty good starter, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says, After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there a little bit. Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Jesus, creator of the universe, right? And not only that, we read in the gospel that all things were made by him and through him. Look at this. Through him were all things made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made or created. Uh, Richard Dawkins, um, he was the author of the book, God of Delu The God Delusion. In an interview, once he said, to be sure, we do need some kind of explanation for the origin of all things. Physicists and cosmologists are hard at work on that problem. You see, he was convinced there couldn't be God, so he had to have another explanation. And he uh, actually Im is one who embraced evolution but going back to the first cause, going back to what started it all, he would have to just say, well, gee, I, I don't know. We're still working on it. We have physicists. We have really smart people working on that, and we're going to come up with it soon. How did it all start? It is really a problem, isn't it? How does something get created from nothing? Dawkins admits, we may never know how it happened. Honestly, we don't. How did God create the universe? What science? What technology? What did he use? None of us know that. And here, here's where we get stumped a lot of times in our thinking through in cosmology, physics, and so forth. If we can't explain how God did it, then we come to the conclusion God couldn't have done it if it isn't something we can explain. And as I've often uh, pondered on this, I've said, well, wait a minute. If I could understand how God did all of these things and I could put it together and in my brain I could, I could uh, figure it out and understand how God created matter out of nothing, how God made the universe just by speaking, we're told, if I could figure all that out, then I would be pretty much on the same level with God, wouldn't I? Wouldn't you? I mean, we would be in such a state that we could play chess with God and have a chance of winning even. How do you like that? It just doesn't add up, does it? God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. The scripture in Isaiah says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth are his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. Are we going to figure it out and know? No, we're probably not. Not in this lifetime. That's kind of where faith enters the picture, isn't it? It created the universe. 
Another thing, not only did Jesus Christ create the universe. You see, we tend to think God the Father created, but we read all things were made by Jesus, the living word, and by his word all things exist. But we're looking again at what Jesus has done. Yes, created the universe. Here's another thing that he has done. Paid the price for our sin. This is pretty cool too. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. It reads like this. After he had provided purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. As simple as that. Jesus died on the cross in this sense, atoning for the sins of the entire world. And what all happened after that dying on the cross? He atoned for the sins of the world. He arose from the grave, and then he ascended to heaven, and then he was seated at the right hand of the Father, wasn't he? And we read that that is where he resides and makes intercession for us right now. And here's, here's how that adds up. You talk about Jesus making intercession for you or mediating for you. You've sinned, you feel guilty, and you're not sure what to do, and you're just sure that God's wrath and punishment are about to be meted out upon you. What's happening in the throne room of God is God the Son says, hang on just a minute. His sins have already been judged. Her sins have already been judged and taken care of in full, 100%, forever and ever. And the wrath of God that was about to step out from the throne of the Father says, Oh, of course. And so there is no condemnation, there is no wrath, and there is no judgment, but just 100% acceptance. 100% joining together with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because that was the job of sin. That was the role of sin to separate between you and God. And here you are in a place where you sin, you feel separated from God, and you're thinking that there is some wrath to be brought out from God against you as punishment for your sin. And then, if your heart is in the Scriptures and you get this, here's what takes you through it. And that is simply Jesus saying, What sins are you talking about anyway? I paid for those long ago. There aren't any. You're clean. You're white as snow. You're pure. Step into the presence of God anytime you want, and he will always hear your prayers. And then you realize, yeah, he paid the price for my sin. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand the majesty and the Father in heaven. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. We read again, Christ sacrificed his life's blood to set us free, which means our sins are now forgiven. Simple as that. We see this repeated over and over and over in the Bible, and yet we have the hardest time believing it, don't we? So many uh, religious approaches to a relationship with God go back to You've got to do something about your sin. You've got to do some good stuff to kind of pay for it. Here's a list of things that you can do as penance for your sins. You've got to say this prayer a hundred times. Folks, Jesus has done everything. When we believe we need something besides Jesus' atonement to take care of our sins, what is that saying? Not good enough, Jesus. Here, I'll do my part. Then it'll be good enough. Where does that put us in our relationship? We're not truly appreciating the atonement of Christ and what he has done for us. The scripture again and again tells us Jesus' blood paid it all. His life paid it all. And the moment we began to believe on Jesus Christ and truly believe that, that his atonement, his death for us has paid the price for our sins, That's when we have full justification. That's when we have this relationship with God that just opens up everything to us. Truth is, the world belongs to him because he made it all. He's the creator. Second thought, your sins can be forgiven because he paid it all. And once again, 
What do you have to do to get your sins forgiven? You've got to do a bunch of good deeds. You've got to pray just right and, and get the words right or pray long enough. No. You need to believe that what he did is all sufficient for not only you, but for the sins of the entire world. And finally, he is indeed the Lord of all. For that very reason, he's all you or I will ever need. Let's pray together. Our God, sometimes we're reminded that in all of our efforts to somehow atone for ourselves or be good enough to be accepted by you, all of that is 100% folly. But we rest in the work of Jesus Christ, not struggle in our own. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. In Christ's name, amen. So friends, today is Communion Sunday. And I think we've gotten used to this particular kind of communion in some services. We're doing the uh, traditional approach to communion in our 915 service. And uh, some of you attend the 915 service as well. One of the things that we've noticed immediately is uh, it takes a lot longer when we do the traditional communion, doesn't it? Which is fine. We may have more of an experience of that. And I would just mention to you, if you're kind of longing for the traditional communion, attend our 915 service and you will have it there as well. Um, but whenever we share in communion, once again, it's a statement of our faith. The body and the blood of Jesus represented herein are a reminder to us that we are saying by our own actions in taking communion, receiving communion, simply saying, I believe that Jesus gave his body for me, that he shed his blood for me, and that is 100% of everything I need to have eternal life with God, have my sins forgiven forever, and to have that relationship. That's part of saying, yes, I believe. And so we know that when Jesus first had communion with his friends or disciples, that he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Then, of course, we're told that after the meal... He took the cup and said, something new here. You guys, have, you guys have experienced this Passover and this Seder cup again and again, but this time I want you to understand something. And he revealed to them that he was the Lamb of God to be slain for the sins of the world. And the cup, the wine, was an outward representation of his life's blood that would be given for the sins of the world. The cup of salvation for the remission of sins. God, we thank you that we can express our faith and have it confirmed to us again and again each time we receive communion, that our statement resounds deeply within our spirit and pushes away our doubts by the grace of God within us by believing that Jesus Christ is indeed all we need. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.